Hey everyone, this is Dr. Prayer and welcome to Philosophy of Physical Activity. Here in chapter 4 you will notice that this particular chapter will have some very nice tie-ins to our sociology of physical activity or kinesiology chapter. So please do pay attention and that way you will grasp the concepts well and be able to also perform well on the exam. Some of the goals for this particular chapter are number one just to understand the underlying foundations of philosophy and how it correlates with our health and physical activity, how it correlates with kinesiology as a general field, and that is especially for forms of exercise, sports, athletics, recreation, leisure, things of that nature, basically any type of movement activity, how the philosophy corresponds with that particular activity, and also some of the greater meanings that it may indicate for future careers. And the second goal is just understanding our own confidence and self-esteem ratios when it comes to our own participation in physical activity. And that becomes especially important when we look at different aspects and different fields such as competition or professional sports, even just in physical education classes, the confidence levels actually do increase as um, our ability increases and vice versa. So we'll, we'll definitely want to take a look at that and how sometimes our mentality can impact our participation and our skill development. And third, understanding the important contributions of physical activity and how it really can increase your quality of life, what it can do just for decreasing pain levels and increasing our productivities, helping with those ADLs and those IADLs that we talked about in chapter three. And number four, learning how we should, <laughs> we should behave in things such as sports or any sort of competition because it's not just sports and athletics that, that lead us to philosophy and breaking down those components as far as how it relates to our lives, but it's also just the, the basic types of competitions that we sometimes don't even acknowledge that we're participating in and how we really do need to learn how to be good sports when it is even something as simple as just walking outside or a group team participation activity that's supposed to be there for camaraderie. And sometimes we can find ourselves really on the other end or on the poor end of ethical and sports relations as it relates to our behaviors. Why do we use philosophical thinking? And this question is not anything that really has one set answer. It, there's quite a bit of subjectivity to it. It's known as the queen of the sciences, and that is is exactly what it, what it means. The queen or the underlying foundational purposes for our sciences. This particular mode of thinking is one that loves education, wisdom, and application as well. So it's not just the facts and the information, but how they relate to the general course of our lives, how they can be implicated in a larger settings or generalized. So these types of things, are it's not just about information. It's not just about subjectivity. It's about relating it to larger areas as well as our individual types of um, encounters. And we'll get onto that as we look at inductive and deductive reasoning in the next few slides. The things that philosophy tend to underlie is some of these larger than life questions. And just think of a two-year-old or a three-year-old who is at that why stage in their life. Go sit down. Why? Eat your vegetables. Why? Some of these questions just have an infinite number of answers depending on who you ask. And some people struggle with this type of concept because they're very, very concrete. If you are a mathematical based person, then sometimes philosophy can be a bit challenging, as is sociology, because there's not anything necessarily concrete for everyone. There's quite a bit of variety. So if two plus two equals four, well, so does three plus one. Well, so does 2.9 plus, you know, 1.1. There's a lot of things that can get you to the same answer. And this can be a challenging aspect of philosophy because meaning of life, larger than life, different ways to get to the same answer, some of that can, can really jar the thinking. But these types of big, larger than life questions um, and the subject nature around them 
are some of the things that we use for research. And it also allows us to be able to look at cross disciplines and interdisciplinary approaches for philosophy as it relates to kinesiology and other fields as well. So we do get that transfer of learning. Now the nature and the value of philosophy, one of the underlying factors is being able to reflect. And that is particularly important as we go into our inductive and deductive reasoning, as well as looking at the reasons why people do things. So go back to the previous bullet when we're, we're thinking about the kid who asks why for everything. That's part of the reflection, why did I do this? Thinking back on what you probably have heard in some of your basic writing classes, especially in high school courses, we had the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And all of those are reflective aspects of writing, as you can think about that also from a philosophical point of view, as you reflect on those different aspects and trying to get to a centralized answer that really will vary with whoever you ask. Some of the various types of reflections that we use are, and I wanna be very clear about the order, personal opinion. Um, your personal opinion is important and it does it does have a strong effect with our subject with our subjectivity and the way we view topics. However, a personal opinion is just that it's an opinion. It is not based in fact. And one of the issues that we often have with facts and philosophy that people have a very hard time, especially when their opinions are strong, with separating the fact that this is their opinion and not a fact. So we have personal opinion and then we have speculation also not given much credence. Speculation is just that, you speculate. And oftentimes there's not a lot of underlying rationale behind the speculation either. So you can think of speculation as kind of a little bit more of a rumor. So your personal opinion is personal to you. Your subjectivity or your speculation um, is something that you may have heard of a piece of a third of an eighth of a bit of truth, but it's still speculative and it's not based in any sort of rationale or truth. Now we, we come over to probable assertion and now we start getting, we start getting someone, we, we start having an underlying foundation of something that could have truth to it. So probable assertion, liken that to the notion of a hypothesis. If you've taken a, a science class, you understand what the scientific method is and your hypothesis is something that is based in probable fact or you have a strong underlying belief that there's gonna be some truth to it, an educated guess. That's probable assertion. And then we have truth assertion, which is just flat out truth. And whether or not you believe in it, whether or not your personal opinion just conflicts with that does not change the fact that a fact is a fact and that it's truth assertion. So this order of personal opinion, speculative, speculation, probable assertion, and truth, this is really the order of importance when we look at philosophical thinking. So your personal opinion doesn't count for too much if there is a truth assertion or a fact that is in direct contrast to that. It doesn't invalidate your feelings, but it does give us somewhere to look um, for concrete information. Now we look at scientists and philosophers working together. Of course, the scientists are very much so fact-based, evidence-based research, and philosophy varies and is subjective. So there, there's quite a bit of contention sometimes between philosophers and scientists because they're supposed to be working interdependently, not independently. That does not mean that independent workings cannot have value as well, but we do want to be able to merge as much fact and science together in addition to the whys and the larger than life questions that we have a, a, a larger worldview and understanding of a topic matter. Now the jigsaw puzzle uh, analogy or mentality, think of it as a variety of ways to solve a puzzle. So some people start and do the edges of a puzzle first. Some people like to put together the sky. Some people like to put together a particular animal or something that will just give them a larger types of, of spatial view to be able to put together the rest of the puzzle. And everybody can approach that, that method differently. I personally like to put together all the colors that, that are, are similar, so all the blues. That's just one way. And other people have their own way of putting together puzzles. As we relate that to um, the scientists and philosophers working together, we need to look at them as interdependent fields. So a philosopher or yourself may like to put together all the blues, where a scientist would like maybe to put together particular animals or particular aspects um, about a puzzle so that the rest of the puzzle comes together easier for them. And we do need to look at 
how both of those methods can be used interdependently in order to get the puzzle put together faster. So one is no better than the other, but with two methods, sometimes you can have a little bit more, um, what should I say, cooperation or fact, or you can get to the answer quite a bit quicker than you normally would. In addition to sometimes getting to the answer faster and having a greater sense of understanding about why that particular situation occurred. Philosophers and scientists really have more of a moral and ethical obligation to, to work together. And of course, there's also variety with morals and ethics. So as you can see, there will never be a consensus with philosophy. And that in and of itself, the nature of what philosophy is, sometimes is contrasting to the ABC method of some scientists. So just keeping in mind that two minds are better than one, I think that can be the easiest way or one of the easiest ways of looking at how scientists and philosophers really do um, or really should work together instead of operating independently and then trying to find an answer after two separate methods of research have been conducted with no consideration for the other. Um, the interdependency of the of the nature of philosophy and science and scientists really goes in line with holistic kinesiology, which is what we're going to get to in the next slide. And holistic kinesiology, there we go. As you can see, it's a subdiscipline of the scholarship of physical activity, which is one of the spheres uh, that we've been talking about. And these these other aspects, motor behavior, sociology, which has a direct um, and important correlation with philosophy, physiology, history, biomechanics, all of these aspects play into philosophy, every single last one of them. So when people say, I'm never going to use history, I'm never going to use this little bit of math that I learned, I use things like that all the time and every day. If you don't know your history, you may have a problem when it comes to sociology of physical activity or sociology of anything because sociology and philosophy are oftentimes heavily rooted in history and the same thing with psychology so it's very important that we don't discount subdisciplines or other t areas of research because we don't see the importance of them because we don't understand the importance of them kinesiology is particularly physical activity and the study of it has very strong roots with history philosophy sociology etc so that's the concept of holistic kinesiology or holistic movement. And then now what do philosophers do? So their goal is to pretty much have a solid understanding of what's going on, whether that's for an individual, a group, a geographical area, or the world in general. They, they want to understand things. They want to know the why. And why is probably one of the hardest things to answer, one of the hardest questions that you're ever going to answer, because why can literally vary with every day. Why didn't you do this? I didn't feel like it. Why didn't you do that? I was sick. Why didn't you do that? I had a more important project. So depending on the day or how you feel, if you're hungry, if you've had your coffee, the why can change. And that's what makes philosophers' jobs a little difficult sometimes. In kinesiology, what this means is understanding our bodies, understanding movement as it's defined from an academic perspective, from physical activity, from sports in general, from a health movement perspective. We just want to know why. And then we move on to the philosophical thinking. It's needed, it's important to address these issues in kinesiology that really haven't been given very much credence prior to the 1996 Surgeon General's report. And one of those aspects is what is the scope of our field? And prior to kinesiology really taking off, it was just PE. But now we have identified 150 types of subdisciplines in kinesiology, which is massive. So that is the scope of our field, 150 different subdisciplines and how each of those deserves their own aspect of study. Um, the, the confidence that we have in our findings. And so the confidence ratios for for social sciences is, is around about 5%, um, you know, 95%. And then for medicine or for scientists, it can be 1% to 2%. So it's a big difference, but they're still both significantly statistically significant. And then what really matters? Once again, very subjective, a large degree of variety in that. And finally, how should we behave as kinesiologists? Um, and once again, all of these aspects, as you can see, are going to have a different answer. I promise you, if I ask you, 
the, any of these four questions, I will get a different response, especially when it comes down to ethics, because that is often based in how we were raised our religion, our geographical locations, and our own moral and ethical compasses.